Good morning, everyone. I'm actually just getting started in a technical sense. I'd like to invite uh, our yeah. Rio opening kickoff remark from Professor Nicholas Fernordis. You'll hear from me in a moment. And uh, between most speakers, I'll also be doing a little bit of technical transitions, trying to make everything as smooth as possible for our audience. Uh, if there are any technical issues uh, to people seeing on watching on Zoom, please do just use the Q&A feature since we have chat disabled uh, to, to let us know, and I'll be occasionally monitoring that. And then also during the panel Q&A, we will, uh, I will be checking the, those questions that are coming in from the internet and sharing them with our uh, panelists. So thank you very much, Professor Marnitis, for our Thank you. Thank you. Josh. Good morning, everyone. Um, <clears throat> just tell me how to uh, Good morning. Um, I want to thank everyone who, who, who is in this room. I understand how difficult these days is to congregate. We have uh, so many distractions that start at six o'clock in the morning with online events, at least for me, they start. Um, <laughs> and they go down to 12 o'clock because of course, if you work with people abroad, um, they don't understand that it is uh, 12 o'clock at night for you or six o'clock in the morning for you or whatever, and, and they need to communicate. Um, so we are all gathered here for uh, an event that is uh, uh, dear to our hearts, at least our hearts uh, speaking from the Elliot School of International Affairs. Um, I represent the Elliot School of International Affairs uh, today as an associate dean, but uh, more than that, I represent I would like to represent my ex-institute. Um, we have, uh, you see that one on the top right there, the Institute for International Science and Technology Policy, um, which is a, a, where I was a director for, for, for a while, longer than I want to remember, uh, <laughs> twice. Um, <laughs> Um, but um, uh, which, uh, which celebrated actually last year its 50th second uh, year of continuous operation. It's one of the oldest in the United States, established at GW with a big grant of NASA in 1970. Um, right there, um, at the very end, right there is my esteemed colleague, um, Scott Pace. Um, who is the director of the sister institute, uh, the Space Policy Institute, uh, right here, and one of the most prominent um, um, experts on uh, U.S. space policy, not only U.S., but international, I guess. Um, uh, otherwise, he would not be in the School of International Affairs. Uh, if you don't know him, uh, if you don't know him, because most of you probably know him, he was the executive director of the U.S. Space Policy Council, Space Council, uh, in uh, during the previous administration. So all these big programs that the United States is, is trying to implement today went through his hands. Now this is this is I mentioned this uh, for another reason. Um, a, a school like the, the Elliott School does not just uh, expect its faculty members to do research and publish, which we do, um, to teach, which we do, um, raise money, which we do, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but also it expects us to, to, to actually get out of the school and influence events and, and, and sort of exchange information. Uh, and through that, uh, bring into the classrooms actually people like you. So it's a kind of welcoming, but also invitation um, to engage more with the school because it has, it has uh, this, uh, this, this, this objective. So, <clears throat> This is the kind of one of the things then that 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 we do in this uh, in in these institutes is to have public events like this, um, or public events like that, uh, which happened just yesterday. Just yesterday, we had here um, in another room um, here the the uh, director, the executive director of the European Space Agency. So people like this, um, or the director of NASA, will walk in our classrooms, actually. Um, just the other day, and Daria here can, can say, because she was in the classroom, 
we had we had the the, the director of the OECD um, of all the technology programs of the OECD. If you go to Andy Andy Wyckoff, Andy Wyckoff was in the classroom. He just dropped by. I don't. Uh, let's go to the classroom. He came to the class. He gave a great talk, and he left. So so we want to engage with the community and and. Um, um we want actually to exchange ideas because this is a school of it prides itself at least as a school of professional studies of international affairs so we want to prepare our students uh, to be useful to you right? uh, come out there and and be and know not only the theory but the practice of, of policy so today we are here for this event this event has a double purpose um on the left hand side here, um, you see that this event is the eighth annual meeting of uh, the European Scientific Diasporas, which is actually uh, the meeting that uh, Jackson and Deria organized because they are representatives of Euraxis, which Euraxis for the last two years actually is located in our suite downstairs, um, the office of Euraxis. And on the other side, you will see that uh, this is blended with GW because uh, GW uh, uh, gave some funding to us uh, to establish a series of university seminars on a very important topic these days that, that we are here to talk about. And this is science diplomacy. Um, so for science diplomacy, uh, the university, this, this academy here has established a university-wide seminar. Um, and, and thus, this event is part of that seminar um, run through the Institute of Science Technology Policy and your access, which is its eighth, eighth annual meeting. Okay, so you are all very welcome here. I will not take uh, any more time. I would uh, like to ask uh, Jackson here, uh, to, uh, who is the, 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 the local uh, head of the office of your access, um, to come on this podium and, and start the event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone. I, I designed the event with the area with the idea that I should get out of the way and let the experts talk. So I'm going to try to keep this as short as possible. Um, firstly, is Professor Bernardis mentioned, uh, two halves of your North America are based in this building. We're very thankful to the university for hosting us, uh, both for this event and then for hosting our office. So Dr. Daria Bukhnar-Karajan is here. I am Jackson Howard. Uh, we've been working since the beginning of 2020 uh, with your Access North America. So I know many of you know us already, but for the quick reminder, we uh, are based here in Washington, D.C., and we cover all of the U.S. and Canada, promoting Europe as a research destination. So we encourage, in some senses, for people to do master's programs. There's really great Erasmus, uh, Erasmus Plus program that you'll hear me talking about a lot next year. Uh, but then beyond that, to do their PhDs, postdocs, and beyond uh, in Europe. And then for those that don't want to go to Europe, also just establish research partnerships with, with uh, European labs, European researchers. Um, and then on the flip side, we want to support research and mobility. It's not about people only going in one direction. So the European researchers that are based in the US and Canada, whether it's short term or they've made North America their new permanent home, we want to support them. Uh, and one of the main ways is by supporting the European scientific diaspora networks. Uh, so for a quick uh, housekeeping comment or sort of run of show, uh, there are three very special diaspora networks that will be having some material in the corner once we start the, the lunch and networking portion. Uh, so once we're done with everything after the panel, we'll have some virtual remarks as well. Uh, I encourage you to say hello to representatives. All, the three representatives are here from those countries. They all have their name tags. You can network with them, but also grab some materials from them. Uh, and then all of the, the, we have some great food today, but the wine and beer, uh, the Red Bull, everything's awesome. Everything is uh, European, excuse me. So please uh, do ask your server just to take a look at the label and uh, find out what, what bottle you enjoy so you can make sure you buy it the next time you're doing the groceries. Um, so I let me think out loud here. Uh, this will all be recorded. It'll be shared afterwards. So to the audience that oftentimes asks if they can get access, usually within 24 or 48 hours, we'll have that. Um, I would like to introduce Florent Bernard, who will give opening remarks. But before I do that, we were very thankful to have pre-recorded remarks from the president of the European Research Council. Uh, so Mar Professor Maria Lepton has been president of the ERC for a little over one year. She's actually in the Washington area today. Uh, and she was hoping to make it work. Uh, she can't. She can't be at the Elliott School today. So, with that in mind, I have a video to play. Thank you for your patience while I get that up. <laughs> and uh, we'll hear from her in just a second.
prepare for our audience. Dear colleagues and supporters in North America, it's a pleasure to address you today. And sad that even though I'm just outside Washington, I can't actually be with you in person. As you know, the ERC was created with a mission to strengthen scientific excellence in Europe. In the early 2000s, top European scientists mobilized and asked the European Union to rethink the foundations of its R&D policy. Europe needed more investments in fundamental research if it wished to keep ahead in a world of growing scientific and technological competition. In 2007, the establishment of the ERC was the result of the scientific community's demands. The ERC was the first EU instrument that sorted, supported bottom-up, investigator-driven research of the highest quality, selected through a Europe-wide competition. In the ERC evaluation, excellence has always been the only selection criterion. Europe has an interest in increasing, in increasing the participation of US researchers in the ERC calls. The ERC has measures in place to encourage applications from all over the world. Perhaps not many of you know that non-European researchers wishing to move to Europe with an ERC grant enjoy a number of concessions. You can keep 50% affiliation to your host institution in the US. You can ask up to 1 million euro top up to cover the expenses of establishing a new research lab in Europe. As of today, almost 400 US nationals resident in Europe hold an ERC grant. Most of them already resided in Europe at the time of application, but around 70 moved to Europe with an ERC grant. It is remarkable that if one looks at the nationality of our grantees, there are more US nationals among them than Swedish or Austrian ones. In addition, 13 US researchers have won ERC grants as members of Synergy grant teams. As you know, these grants allow one PI in the group to be based outside Europe or an associated country. As a result, we have a core group of excellent US scientists who are ERC grantees and leading universities in the US. Since 2012, more than 80 US researchers have joined ERC teams for short periods in the framework of the visiting scheme between the ERC and the National Science Foundation, the so-called implementing arrangement, which allows people to spend time in ERC labs in Europe. This is great, but it could be even better. And we would like to cooperate with more US researchers. And this is why the help with uh, your access today, we hold regular information meetings with the US research community. I believe that this large group of US researchers, including ERC grantees in Europe and the US, and those who have visited ERC teams, are a valuable, valuable resource to multiply the future opportunities of scientific collaboration between outstanding scientists in the two continents. So I hope to see somewhere, some of you somewhere again soon and wish you a nice meeting. Uh, so I wanna briefly just add that Professor Lupton's remarks were, were quite astute. Also what she said about the US applies in the same sense for Canada, not the statistics, but the fact that, the, that Europe is open to the world. Uh, and actually, Canada has some very uh, encouraging news and that uh, the country is continuing to advance in bilateral negotiations with the European Commission to be considered an associated country uh, for research and innovation, uh, which would basically allow it to be treated as if it were an EU member state, again, for purposes of research. Uh, and New Zealand's also in the same in the same boat. Uh, so your access worldwide, there's nine hubs of ours around the world outside of Europe. And those of us uh, that have countries negotiating for associated country status are quite enthusiastic because it'll give a lot more access to researchers uh, based in those countries. So uh, to our audience joining virtually from Canada, do know that uh, hopefully good things to come in a short time frame. So stay tuned for more news. Uh, so with that, I will take a moment to transition everything on the computer, but I want to give a very warm welcome to Dr. Florent Bernard. He is the EU delegation science counselor, uh, counselor for research and innovation since September of last year. And in just over the one year time frame, we've been able to overlap as your access from America and the EU delegation. 
in several events, and we've been extremely thankful and indebted for their support, both at in-person events and just letting us, giving us connections and helping us secure excellent speakers. So um, as a general just content, uh, comment of appreciation, I want to thank George Washington University once more for helping to put together this great co-hosted event and uh, welcome an honorary citizen of Georgia, Dr. Florent Bernard, uh, to represent the EU in, in this great country as well. So give me one second while I get Oh, just with the general screen, uh, most like, or or well, thank you. Is that working? Yes, thank you, Jackson. Thank you, Daria, for this uh, amazing event, and thanks to Nicholas and and the Elias School for hosting uh, this important event today. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here in person. Um, just to reassure me, we're not in the metaverse, right? It's, a, <laughs> it's an in-person meeting where we'll probably never find out. Uh, but it's great, no, it's great to be uh, in person. It's a very important, critical, and interesting time for transatlantic relations, for scientists across the Atlantic. Uh, the global context is very, uh, complex, and uh, as you will see in the words I will address you now, the, the scientists and the researchers have a, a, an important role to play. Um, and I think this uh, topic of science diplomacy is really welcome. Uh, you should all be aware of what science diplomacy is. Uh, I'm a science diplomat myself, and uh, I will try to navigate you in this complex world in, in, in the next minutes. But I think this is something that you will really have to pay attention to as a scientist uh, in, in your career. So the, the world of science and the conduct of science used to be quite simple. We would equate the increase of knowledge to the increase in the improving of our livelihoods. That's what we used to call progress. And that's what was valid until very recently. This is much more complex today. Scientists are asked more and more to actually solve problems we have created ourselves. The climate crisis with clean tech, we're asked to solve the emission problem we've created. Pandemics, we are asked to solve problems that we've created through deforestation, uh, food security, overuse of pesticides, and you name it. So there is a lot of issues that you as scientists are being asked to solve. It's much more complex than it used to be in the past where you would just think, oh, let's increase knowledge. We're going to improve the world and improve the livelihood of, of, of people. And it's not just that. Science and technology are also at the core now of global uh, tensions. Uh, if you see how the research on chips is performed and is creating uh, international turmoil, uh, the use of AI, uh, the use of face recognition, the threat to our democracy through uh, technology, is also something that is real and that you have to take into account at the time where you engage in international cooperation uh, with other countries and at the time where you decide which direction your research will take. You have to think ahead and not just increase knowledge like we used to do uh, in the past. You also have a societal role to play. We've seen with the COVID crisis, the anti-vax movement was high and well followed online. This is something as scientists who are not equipped to fight against, and your role in society is even more important to make understand how a scientific community works. Because I've had so many friends, non-scientists, sending me videos of one person who has a PhD saying that vaccines don't work and so on. And I had a hard time always to explain, but that's not what it, how the scientific community works. You have to, real, you can say whatever you want, as a scientist, but you have to come with a proof, and this has to go under the scrutiny of the whole community. It's not just because you're a scientist that you hold the truth. And this is something you also have to engage more in the society to make sure that your friends, your family understand that, that very well. So your life is very complex. It was already complex to do research, but it's even more complex because you have to think about many other aspects now, and that's why science diplomacy is, is, is very important. But fortunately, the EU is there. The European Union is there to guide you and to help you. 
We've done so, we've taken the leadership in, in many of these aspects I've just mentioned. So we have published the global approach to research innovation last year, which helps you understand how to navigate the international world of cooperation in research innovation and how to ensure openness because science has no border. We have to remain as open as possible, but also being cautious uh, when you uh, engage in international cooperation, making sure that you know where you step in, uh, in, in your partnership. The EU is dealing in other areas like the Green Deal, uh, the biodiversity strategy, the food to fork strategy, and the digital um, agenda. All these regulatory aspects are meant to solve uh, part of the problem I, I mentioned, of course, and they have an effect beyond the EU. Uh, We've seen with the digital uh, agenda, it has a big effect in the Silicon Valley. And that's what people call the Brussels effect. Uh, so we, we have to acknowledge that the EU regulatory power has, is a very global and powerful power and, uh, uh, and, and very uh, important for our work. All those regulations, the Green Deal, the biodiversity, the circular economy, uh, the digital agenda are all underpinned by research and innovation component. Uh, and this research innovation component is implemented through our program, the European uh, Union Program for Research Innovation, which is called Horizon Europe, which you are all invited to, to apply for and to join. And it's really our science diplomacy tool uh, also to work with the US. And I have good news on that regard, because it can be, it's called a European uh, uh, framework program, but it's actually very international. It's open to any participant in the world and especially uh, to US participants. And here you have a big role to play as European diaspora in North America, because probably many of you are aware of how this works and you're really encouraged to bring your uh, US peers to join this, uh, this, this, this program. We have made it very easy for now for the US researchers to join. In the past, um, they had to sign a grant agreement under Belgian law with a lot of liability, et cetera. This is over. It's very simple now. Uh, the US partners just need to agree with one of the partner of the project and become an associated partner status. So this is the magic word to get our US friends to join this program, the associated partner status in Horizon Europe allows for flexible and easy way for US researchers to join our program. And the good news is that um, we just had in October a huge meeting with Department of States, uh, the USTP, and um, many of the other US agency, NSF, NIH, NIST, um, you name it, to agree on the future of our cooperation. And those Conclusion are public, um, and we've agreed that it's of utmost importance that the US and the EU increase their cooperation, their bilateral cooperation. And the way we are going to do that is through Horizon Europe. So if I have only one message for today in this context of science diplomacy, in the global context I just mentioned, which is very tense and very real, please do reach out to your US peers and invite them to be part of Horizon Europe projects. You have one duty, is to bring America to Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fran. So uh, at this point, I'll, I'll invite all of the panelists up or after Dr. Van Orders to meet the panel. I'll just be here for a moment getting the technical aspects set up. Very good. Please. I'll offer the screen here. Yes. It's the first time I think you're in the room. No, yeah. It's really the first time. Yes. You see, no. I know. No. We are all women. So, what is that? The bird is a bird. Instead of a man, what is this song? Oh, it's very.
Am I dominated here or what? Am I a small minority? You're the moderator. So. Oh, um, uh, in fact, uh, 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 Bertrand uh, talked about changes, but this is another thing um, <laughs> that's happening in our world. Um, um, uh, not so long ago, we put together a panel and it had only men. It happened to have only men because they were the experts in, in this particular topic in space policy. Um, um, they, these men, then the panelists, talked about a paper that was authored by a woman. Um, and, and guess what happened afterwards? The university got serious complaints, um, open complaints, uh, that this is not possible in this century. Um, that uh, if we are talking about a, a paper that was authored by a female, um, we should have uh, her or some other female on the panel. Um, so we were a little bit more careful now. And please take a lot of pictures. Please, please, a lot of pictures uh, because I'm going to go to the management later and say, okay, this is this is the message is taken. Um, um, I, I was very, very happy uh, to when 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 Jackson and Daria asked me to actually moderate this 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 excellent panel, and you will see why I call it excellent. Um, um, uh, for various reasons. First, because the topic of science diplomacy is becoming critical for our program. Um, second, uh, because uh, as you understand from my accent, um, I am a, a, a product of diaspora. Um, I come from a little, little, tiny, unknown corner of Europe. Um, not important at all, uh, only that it gave the name to Europe, um, just, just that, uh, but, but not important. So I'm here, and, and why more? One more is because I do understand from personal experience what, uh, what diaspora means and what are the dilemmas. During my career in the United States, which is longer than I want to think about, um, I've had three offers to go back to Europe, three in different countries. Um, um, uh, I, I obviously I declined all three, and they were good offers. Um, and they, uh, what 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 I mentioned then to all these these people uh, was the same the same message. You see me in the United States. You see me in a particular context. You think that we take this person out of that context, you put him, in this case, um, in, uh, in, in somewhere in Europe, um, and you think that you will reproduce the same stuff. That's wrong. That's a mistake. I live in a context, and I produce in a context. Uh, and thus, if you want me to, to come to, 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 the, to, to Europe, create a context. You know who, who has created that context? better than Europe, and, and I leave it for you, and I will introduce now the panel. As a thought, Brazil. Brazil, in where I have a big operation now, have actually gotten the, the, the message. So they created a special kind of a product, of a program, only for foreigners, um, or some, uh, they call it some Paulo Excellence Chair, and they want you only for three months. Anytime you want, any day you want, it doesn't matter whatever, whatever, whatever time you want to go to Brazil and the big money and significant money. The big money is for the team around you. I have about 14 people working for me down there all the year round for eight years now. Now think about that and think about the European, the European uh, um, 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 sort of proposals that I had to consider in the past that that what were giving me some significant funding to go to to move to Europe, to leave my job here and move to Europe. Much more difficult. I'm leaving you with that thought. Now, <laughs> this esteemed panel next to me, um, uh, which which uh, I is going to really, really, really uh, tell us some important things here. Um, what I'm going to do is um, 
Um, I'm going to introduce one by one as we go uh, down the table here. I, we have asked them to make some initial, you know, take an initial position on the on the very general subject, which I will I will also mention here. Um, and 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 then at the end we will start a discussion. I will be asking questions. But also the audience can ask questions. Um, so uh, it will be an open discussion, and not every panelist will 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 necessarily address all the questions. Right? They will they will pick the question. Uh, please try to be concise when you when you ask questions. I would really no statements. Please don't uh, let's avoid the statements. Ask a question. Um, and then I will ask the panelists to, to avoid the uh, bigger uh, and try to be uh, precise on the answer. Okay. So, right next to me here, uh, we have uh, um, um, our colleague, uh, Alison Schweier. Um, she is actually, her office is across the street right there, uh, it's at the Department of State. She holds a very important position for the United States, especially today. Uh, critical position. She is the uh, science and technology advisor to the Secretary of State. Uh, there cannot be any more critical position than this um, for the United States uh, when we talk about uh, mobility, science and mobility, and 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 um, <clears throat> uh, science uh, uh, science policy. Right. So, so I want to ask. Um, she has many acclaims. You have them. You can see where, where she was. Um, she was in, uh, and let me just mention that she has a PhD and a, a Master's of Science in Chemical Engineering. She's a smart person. <laughs> I'm a smart person here. I, I could never do this. I'm, I have only economics. I'm lonely, you know, like, like this one. Um, uh, but uh, but uh, she, she has those degrees from, from, from what was then in the 80s. Our big competitor, Columbia, because I was downtown at New York University. You know, they were the competitors. Um, and before then, uh, Pennsylvania State University. So she's a very accomplished person, and please pay attention to her. So this is the first, the first item that I will ask all. Given the rapid changes in the geopolitical environment and the increasing complexity and uncertainty that these changes are bringing, right? What do you see as the complications in the movement, mobility of people and knowledge? How do these dynamics affect talent mobility? Alice. <laughs> um, sorry, sorry, sorry. Alice, yes. Thank you so much. And it's, it's really a delight to be here with all of you today, especially talking about this important topic, transatlantic science exchange. I myself am a product of this concept after I received my PhD in chemical engineering at Columbia, where I focused on aerosol research. I moved to Clermont-Ferrand in France to work at CNRS, Le Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, as a postdoctoral researcher. So I was really interested in seeing how science was done elsewhere in the world. What was different? What was the same? I studied ocean acidification in the Mediterranean to see how it would affect regional weather patterns in Europe. I engaged with scientific communities on both continents. I learned how science was funded in Europe. I saw the importance of large-scale, multi-country scientific projects. And eventually, I moved back to the United States, where I transitioned into science diplomacy, first at the US Senate and then at the US Department of State. So I am an example of a very short time scale of scientific exchange, that two-year postdoctoral experience. But scientists around the world share citizenship in a scientific community that solves local, regional, and global challenges. Science diasporas have a unique combination of expertise, networks, and cultural understanding that can lead the way in solving these global challenges and building the innovation economies of the future. In an age of increased mobility and connectivity, this group includes scientists, students, innovators, entrepreneurs, as well as science policy experts that are working outside of their country of birth, speaking a common language, science, and building partnerships. These ties have great potential to help advance economic development and international cooperation. Every country's economic competitiveness, development, and stability 
depends on its capacity to participate in the globally interconnected knowledge-based economies of the 21st century. So why is this important? We have to empower people everywhere with science and technology because solutions and challenges, local or global, can come from anywhere and will more often than not be an idea that is developed and tested by teams that span national and institutional borders, both the solutions and the challenges that those solutions are trying to solve. A good example of this are the recipients of the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2022, which was awarded to John Clauser, but also Alain Aspe and Anton Seilinger, both of whom, the latter two, took part in the Maurice Ludovska Curie actions as supervisors. Dr. Zeilinger was a Fulbright student supported early in his career by the US and Austrian governments to study at MIT in 1976. And he is one of 62 Fulbrighters uh, who were supported by the US government who have been awarded the Nobel Prize afterwards. So the Fulbright program in partnership with governments in Europe and around the world has supported more than 400,000 American and foreign participants sits in its inception in 1946 to study, research, and teach in one another's country. The Fulbright program is one example of this, but we will need to bring resources and talent to bear on some of the biggest challenges facing our societies today, many of which Florent already mentioned, health security, energy security, climate smart solutions, food insecurity, agricultural innovation. These challenges cannot be solved by one country, making transatlantic science and technology relationship even more of an imperative. We need a mix of all different scientific disciplines, soft and hard sciences, working across borders to come up with creative solutions that are sensitive to the needs of society and that are solutions that are actually workable. Cross-cultural collaboration stirs up latent revolutionary creativity we all need. And we know that diversity leads to more efficient and productive companies that can yield more innovative solutions. Great groups with racial and cultural diversity have been shown to solve problems more creatively and significantly outperform those without such diversity. So we have to develop new intentional strategies to engage underrepresented groups. Cultivating a network of diasporas is crucial to building these bridges. A welcoming environment for science and technology excellence and expertise that balances the need to maintain established research norms with opportunities for diasporas to maintain home linkages can be a key contributor of innovation and trust between countries. We in the United States are seeking to build broad coalitions then to solve these global challenges and to realize President Biden's vision of a free, open, secure, and prosperous international order. Diasporas are an integral part of that vision. So I want to leave us with one thought for our discussion, and I think then I can address Nick's question after perhaps the, the panel goes through, um, but how can we revolutionize the, the, the diaspora landscape and change it from bilateral flows to a sprawling cross-cutting networks where you have diasporas from multiple countries collaborating together? We, the entire panel is here today because we see a synergy. We believe combining science diplomacy and with outreach to diasporas, we can push the envelope on not just what we know, but who can benefit from that knowledge. We can help our scientists achieve what nations struggle mightily to do, come together to solve the challenges we may have formed, but that we certainly cannot solve on our own. So thank you so much. Very much looking forward to the conversation and back to Nick. Thank you. Much. Um, um, we will move to Dr. Montgomery. Uh, Tim Montgomery is a director of the International Affairs and Science Diplomacy uh, a program at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, if anyone in this room does not know the AAAS, um, you should better look at it. Um, it's, the <laughs> it's the most important scientific organization in, the, in, 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 in this country with uh, hundreds of thousands, I don't know how many members and um, great conferences and so forth, but most importantly, um, this is the organization that actually trains uh, people, scientists, to be able to, to talk uh, the, the language of the policy decision makers. Uh, because obviously, neither the policy decision makers uh, speak the language of science in this country, nor the scientists uh, can, uh, are able to speak the language of the policy decision makers. Um, our program, actually, if you ask me, what does your program do downstairs, the uh, master's in, in, 
in science, technology, policy, alternative, we translate. We are translators. <laughs> we, 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 we actually try to, to train people uh, to, to handle both, both items. Okay, Alison, uh, I mean, uh, Kim um, has done a lot of important things and including uh, among them is, is that she has worked for EEASA in, mm -hmm. in, in Europe, right? Uh, which is, let me read it, International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in my beloved Vienna, um, a beautiful city, um, and an International Atomic Energy uh, Agency. Um, so she is a graduate. Uh, she has a PhD in psychology and neuroscience um, uh, from Princeton University, not a bad place, um, and, and, and then a degree in cognitive science from Northwestern, another easy place to go to, right? Okay, Kim, how are you? Um, thank you so much. Uh, first, I want to thank you for including me in this panel today. It's, it's a real privilege to participate in this eighth annual meeting of the European Scientific Diasporas in North America in the GW University series, uh, seminar series on science diplomacy. I wanna thank all uh, the organizers uh, for inviting me to participate and I wanna thank our hosts for uh, the panel. And it's really wonderful to be at GW. I, I've spent um, the living in, in Europe for several years. I spent a long time in and out of DC but haven't spent that much time in GW. So it's, it's really nice to be here today. Um, as mentioned in the introduction, I'm the Director of International Affairs and Science Diplomacy at AAAS, uh, which was funded by scientists in 1848 as a scientific society. So next year, we're going to celebrate our 175th birthday, so stay tuned for wonderful things on that. But over the last almost 175 years, it's evolved into a mission-driven, uh, multidisciplinary general scientific society with members around, around the globe. Um, and it's also... Uh, the well-known publisher of the Science Family of Journals. Uh, AAAS's mission is to advance science, technology, and innovation for the benefit of all, or put more simply, to advance science and serve society. And I'm delighted to be at AAAS, leading on strategic international relationships, developing stronger connections between the scientific and diplomatic communities, and managing the Center for Science Diplomacy. And the center is focused on building um, a a science diplomacy stakeholder community, uh, providing opportunities for science diplomacy training, and for demonstrating science diplomacy as an essential element of foreign policy. Um, and so just because this is a seminar on science diplomacy, I'm going to take a little liberty to not surprisingly say that since I'm from AAAS, I always find it helpful to start with the framework for science diplomacy that was developed by AAAS and the Royal Soci Society of London, uh, which is entitled The New Frontiers of Science Diplomacy and was published in 2010. And this framework lays out three dimensions to better understand the nexus between science and diplomacy. So the first is science in diplomacy, and you can think about that as being scientific knowledge and expertise helping to inform diplomatic objectives and, and policy making. Number two is diplomacy for science, diplomatic initiatives helping to foster international scientific cooperation and strengthen domestic and worldwide scientific capabilities. And science for diplomacy is international scientific engagement, helping to advance diplomatic objectives, including utilizing science as soft power to improve relations between countries. Um, obviously, this framework is, is not perfect, but I think it can be a useful um, to provide a common structure for what we're talking about. Um, and when we're talking about science diplomacy, I, I start from a position of optimism. I do believe in the power of science and as a mechanism to engage with other countries and build better bilateral and multilateral ties. However, as it's already been mentioned, science diplomacy operates within a context, just like you do did. Um, and this one is becoming a lot more challenging. Um, and in a, my colleague, Bill Coblazer and I recently suggested in a recent editorial in Science and Diplomacy, one might argue that we've moved from an era of engagement and cooperation into a new era of competition and cooperation. And this shift is a reminder that science diplomacy is not above politics, but I would argue that's always been true. Um, but this changing and complicated landscape may mean that politics can impact science diplomacy even more. Um, but it doesn't change the value of science diplomacy. It, science diplomacy is and will remain an essential tool for the scientific and foreign affairs enterprise. Um, 
but it doesn't mean it won't be affected by the new era. It will be. Scientific cooperation between certain countries, like potentially the US and China, will likely be less robust than it has been in previous decades. A growing number of relationships between countries may be estranged, potentially leading to severed diplomatic ties. But science, so science diplomacy is facing a different and changing landscape, but I would argue this is not the time to throw up our hands um, and become cynical about the power of science diplomacy to affect change and reduce conflict. Instead, this new era calls for strengthening new efforts. If more countries have strained relationships, using the power of, soft, uh, of science to maintain and improve those relationships is going to be even more important. And if the world is going to make progress on some of the problems that have already been discussed, like climate change and food security, even if we are the reason those problems exist, international cooperation is essential to do that. And to ensure that cooperation remains, it will be even more imperative to successfully articulate that fostering international scientific collaboration remains in the national interest of the country. And so this is why I'm so excited about this event, because this calls this new era, calls for a time of even more of a role for informal actors. And so those actors, when you think about who those might be, scientific diasporas spring to mind right away. These are individuals that can help develop and maintain connections between the scientific communities of their home nation and their current nation that they're in right now. Um, and so I really think there's a, a huge important role that they can play in this new era of science diplomacy. Um, and I always end my remarks by saying that science diplomacy is about relationships. I often say that I'm in the relationship game, and that's especially true if you're in a scientific diaspora community as well. And so um, it is my hope that even in this new era, we can work together uh, to maintain those relationships and build even stronger relationships that can address the new context that we're in. I'm really looking forward to the discussion and ways that we can work together to achieve our common goals. Thank you so much. Thank you. Of course, it's easier said than done, um, and 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 I cannot. I was thinking of a dissertation actually that we produce here um, in 2015 uh, by a Lebanese uh, person. Um, he is now the representative of the World Bank in Seoul, Korea. Um, so 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 he was very much interested in in the Lebanese um, uh, diaspora, which is amazing in terms of both science and business in the United States. And at the end of a very elaborate dissertation with involving surveys, involving documents, I mean, uh, you name it, this guy really did a big job because he was using the World Bank a project in the World Bank to approach people. He found out this. The diaspora was involved with Lebanon, only they were doing nothing about Lebanon other than going for vacations. So what 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 the involvement of the diaspora is with uh, with uh, with the original country or with different countries uh, can mean uh, can can be very different. Um, uh, when when you look at the diaspora of the country where he is located now, which is Korea. Um, you will see that the, the role of that diaspora and the development of that country was completely different, right? So um, just, just a look. Um, I want to, to go uh, to move on to, to our third panelist, uh, uh, Dr. Daria Buyutamir Karasan. I hope I said it right. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Daria um, um, has been working with us uh, quite intensively. She is the co-organizer of this event together with Jackson. Uh, she is a visiting scholar and an adjunct professor at our institute downstairs, the Institute for International Science and Technology Policy. Uh, she is also the program manager of Euraccess North America here. Um, she has a degree from uh, 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 in economics, actually she's closer to what I know, to, uh, in economics and international relations of the European of the European Union from Ankara University in Turkey, where she she lived uh, most of her life. Um, she has been a postdoctoral fellow at Georgetown, which I should omit here. I should not mention it very much. <laughs> Um, um, I forgot that. I forgot that you did this. Um, I, don't uh, I don't remember that. Well, please, uh, <laughs> please. I don't. I don't like that. Um, um, and 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 very importantly, actually, for her current position, she has participated in many European 
projects uh, 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 that are dealing with this issue. So I am eager to hear what she has to say. There you are. Thank you. Uh, I, okay. Well, thank you, Nick, for the kind of introduction. Uh, I was not expecting that you're going to deal with all the things <laughs> about me. So yes, uh, um, I'm here and I have two hats. Uh, you so your access North America. So and I'm also a researcher. So what I do is that with the help of these two hats, first of all, I uh, have some experiences how to link the researchers and also how to help researchers have their career development and as well as um, how to connect with diaspora leaders. This is really important because I think through your access, this is one of the things that I can, I mean, personally do and see their all, uh, you know, problems and challenges. And through George Washington University, I'm a researcher, I'm a forum researcher, so I'm a part of this diaspora network. So with these two hats, I have a lot of experience to see what we have, the challenges and also opportunities. So for me, it's a great pleasure to be here and share my, you know, experience. Uh, and as you know, uh, there, there is an increasing number of students and scientists and professionals moving internationally. And there are some reasons for that. Uh, and um, when they move from one country to another, what they do, I mean, as a researcher, I also, we want to create our own networks or try to belong to another networks that just to feel the belonging to our community, right? But the scientific networks are a bit different and we have more, I think, um, uh, missions than the others. So because of this recently, I think many countries have just realized the importance of the scientific diasporas and how they can engage them into their policies and science diplomacies, right? It's not only the policies of migration or health or education, but uh, as Kim mentioned, this is a new, uh, science diplomacy is a new concept. And why today's meeting is important because we are discussing two new concepts, right? I mean, relatively, because we have been talking about diasporas for a long time, but historically and culturally, but scientifically, we haven't really. So how we can really combine these two topics into one? And today, I think it's really important to uh, know how we can contribute. Uh, I mean, in terms of how we can engage these scientific diasporas into our science diplomacy policies. And uh, so um, I believe that uh, scientific networks uh, attract the attention of many countries recently, and uh, um, and we are also discussing how to be open, how to be inclusive, how to be more interdisciplinary, right? And so these diasporas, scientific diasporas, are the power of networks. So how the how we can reach out to them and how we can create new communication channels would definitely benefit to these policies. So I wish today's event is going to open new uh, discussion platforms for us in the future uh, and try to, I mean, I wish that we are going to see the good examples as well, because I can provide uh, some of the countries how they try to engage more with, with scientific diasporas like France, like Spain, Germany, and also not only the uh, developed countries, but also from the other uh, global South countries, there are so many other countries who just realize the benefits or contrib uh, contribution or value of these diasporas. So I hope at the end of this panel, we will be uh, discussing more about these, uh, you know, examples and, and what we can do also, how we can engage them more in our uh, science diplomacy policies. Thank you, Daria. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Actually, for starting, uh, this saying that this is not a, a, a new topic, of course, uh, uh, but uh, like we have made significant um, 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 uh, progress in other in in related topics. For example, remember when I was going to school, we were talking about brain drain. I think only dumb people talk about brain drain today. 
read it down. Um, people today talk about brain game. Right? So, so if there is any country out there that does not consider its expatriates as a game, then this is a dumb, dumb country. Uh, they don't understand what's going on uh, at all. So, so, so I, I share this view that um, um, this is an old topic, but uh, we can put it in, in some more um, firm foundations and, and discuss it more intelligently than, than we have in the past. Um, I want to, to move uh, to the left of Deria, uh, sits uh, Evelina Santa Tale. Uh, and Evelina is uh, the uh, science counselor of the German embassy here in town. Uh, obviously, a very important country uh, with a lot of lessons um, <clears throat> um, to teach us. For example, it can teach the United States of how the hell they can maintain their industry when we cannot, their manufacturing. I mean, we have been struggling and we cannot, and their workers are even more expensive than ours. So, Please. Um, so, um, uh, but uh, importantly, uh, uh, she has uh, had very important positions even before arriving in Washington. And one I see here, which I, I, I'm sorry, I was not aware of this before, uh, that um, you have been the overall coordinator of the German EU Council Presidency. At least in the ministry. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, in, in 2020, uh, okay, this is very important. Um, so she has been educated at uh, uh, Vienna uh, uh, University and Kroningen University, Vienna in Austria, Kroningen in Latin China. Who knows where Kroningen is? No. <laughs> Netherlands, Netherlands. It's a very important uh, city in the east of Nef uh, Northeast. Um, so, Evelina, without further ado, you. Thank you very much, Nicholas, and um, uh, thank you for hosting me today. Uh, it's a very uh, great pleasure to, for me to be here, and uh, I think it's a very timely discussion we are having here. Uh, and it's so nice to see that uh, all my fellow uh, speakers have a very uh, also diaspora background. Um, I also used to work in Spain and in Brussels, being from Vienna now working for Germany. So it's um, I think we we all contribute quite a lot to to this discussion today. Um, I would like to bring a very a national perspective into this uh, discussion. I'm sorry I cannot answer your questions with regards to uh, industry policy so much. I didn't prepare my notes for that. <laughs> but uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I try to answer your, I'll try to answer your first question in, in my introductory remarks. So. Um, and I would like to, to take a look back first, of, 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 as I said, uh, from the national perspective, German uh, foreign policy and the German government itself uh, posed a strong emphasis in the last 20 years on uh, international research collaboration. So why was that? I mean, uh, we, know, we all know it was uh, growing globalization, uh, made the need for, to tap into new innovation hubs all over the world. Uh, to remain competitive. Um, it was also about solving grand challenges and this uh, still about solving grand challenges. So we had to uh, join our forces with many other partner countries to, to really tackle these challenges. It was also, of course, of, um, for increasing researchers' mobility um, and brain circulation, brain gain uh, is a very important topic for us. And, and it increases our uh, Germans' um, overall national research excellence in that respect. So many reasons why uh, we really um, focus very much on uh, strengthening our networks, uh, in uh, strengthening our diaspora networks through financially supporting more and more the German academic exchange services, um, um, different um, um, uh, yeah, institutions expanding their networks. So also on the research uh, ministry level, on the government level, we, we uh, have many MOUs, uh, bilateral corporations, and so on going on with many countries. So it was an era of really increasing our cooperation and strengthening our ties and building bridges. And of course, we also got very much involved in a strong partner in the European research area on the European level. So this was a commitment from the German government. Um, and then 2020 came and I was asked to, to prepare the German EU Council presidents in the ministry. And we, have a, uh, we had everything set. Uh, 2019, my team and I, we started to work and we have a, had everything set. 
And then the COVID pandemic ended. <laughs> and we had to more or less turn upside down all our plans for the, uh, for the presidency. And not only because we couldn't uh, do any events as we planned them, but also when it came, uh, when, when, we, when we talked about the content of our presidency, of course, we wanted to make an impact with that presidency. And uh, where we first wanted to, you know, strengthen uh, the European research area, also finish the negotiations on, on the new framework program. Uh, we also saw we need to do something on uh, research and the freedom of research, because we saw with the COVID pandemic that uh, researchers and research was, were very much under threat. There was um, much of disinformation. We all know that uh, researchers were and scientists were attacked for their for their findings, um, and so we we thought we have to do something about it, and that's why we really, as I said, turned our program upside down and said okay, we will uh, want to do a declaration. We want to bring nations together and say um, and really make a statement on, on freedom of research. So it was uh, what this was one of our main topics of the presidency. Um, it is um, everything was brought together then at the Bonn Declaration on the freedom of research. And I'm happy that there are many countries have, uh, who have signed this declaration, uh, EU countries, but also non-EU countries, we're really giving a strong message to that. And then, uh, well, everyone knows what happened on March 24th, uh, Russian uh, aggression and war against Ukraine started. And this was a real inflection point in uh, German and European history, I think. And as our chancellor quote, coined the quote of Zeitenwende, it is a real Zeitenwende, it's a real turning point, and it has affected um, research collaboration or science policy very much uh, in, uh, since then. And we had to de-evaluate uh, our complete, or we are still re-evaluating and then reorienting our, our foreign uh, science diplomacy and foreign science policy uh, approach. So, um, Actually, in the in a in the short term, we what we did was to freeze all cooperation with Russia. This was the first measure, and this was a very strong message, I think. And many countries followed uh, to uh, on the on the governmental level. So we have uh, no uh, programs running anymore with the Russian government or Belarusian government, and uh, and in the same way, we uh, immediately stepped up our uh, support for Ukraine researchers and Ukraine research system. Um, so this was a very short-term measure to and a very short-term response to uh, to what happened on uh, in March, but in the long run uh, we will see the, the effects coming and we, it's still uh, of course not completely clear uh, how, where this will go. But what we see and I think this is somehow contradictory to what probably some of my fellow speakers are saying. I think science has become more political uh, since then at least. Um, I think there is a need for more embeddedness of science policy into foreign policy, into trade policy, into um, you know, climate policy, you name it. So uh, it has become a central part. It should become, I think, also a central part of, of, of foreign, or, or, you know, thinking about foreign policy and things like that. So um, what we did is to, to set up a new science policy strategy, uh, which is based on three pillars. It's uh, about connecting, so still uh, being open enough to, to really collaborate, but with like-minded states also to with those states who are who share our values and be cautious at least with those states who don't share these values or even free no cooperation. But then again, it's also about enabling uh, our our mission as science policymakers is also to to create the framework to to create the guiding rails for for researchers and for research to to remain open to be free to remain free. It's also um, uh, written down in our constitution, in the German constitution, so we are very much of course committed to that. And it's also about informing. I mean, science has to continue to uh, inform policymakers, to inform society, because we are, besides the war, uh, facing, I mean, all these challenges. Many, Laurent has named them, and uh, my fellow speakers as well. So um, we have to continue to do that. And uh, this is, and we have to step up to it even more uh, than probably uh, in, the, in the past years. So, um, yeah, I think I will leave it up to that and I'm looking forward to the discussion and thank you very much.
Thank you, Evelina. Um, uh, you put it uh, quite right, actually, because I can tell you exactly why, right? Um, <clears throat> on October 5th this year, um, I participated in a, in a, a very important international conference co-organized by your, um, um, uh, your Fraunhofer Society, um, the, the, the head of the Karlsruhe, uh, office of the of the Fraunhofer Society, which is the office that deals with policy, um, and uh, very prominent people from Korea, the ex advisors of economics and of uh, science technology policy to the president of Korea. It happened in Seoul, uh, and it is online for all of you to 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 go and watch. I strongly recommend that you watch that that conference and send me an email to send you the link. <laughs> Um, uh, this was on what topic do you think? Technology sovereignty. Mm. My God, I, I, I have been, uh, I have grown in an era of globalization. And when I hear things like that, I, I, I get my hair stand still. Um, absolutely uh, impossible. Um, in that, actually, uh, Delia was very much invited in this, and she could not because Jackson, it's your mistake. She was telling me that, that she was working for you and she didn't come. Right? I, 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 I keep it. Um, so, 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 so this was a very important event, and I strongly recommend is is on uh, online. I strongly recommend that you see it because people spoke openly um, about what does it mean and what does it mean for. Big countries like the United States, small countries like Korea, uh, medium countries like Brazil, um, uh, and, and so forth. Because the meaning is very, it's terrible. Uh, the wake-up call, of course, for, for Germany came in 2016, um, when uh, suddenly the Germans woke up and they saw one of their crown jewels in manufacturing, um, um, a company called Kuke, Kuka being bought out by China. Um, and at that point, uh, they freaked out, although this is a very legal process, right? I mean, it's fine. Um, somebody buys a company, that's not a problem. It should not be a problem, but it was now. So something has, has changed dramatically in, 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 in that country, right? Um, so so, so this, is, this is something to talk about and, 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 and sort of the role of science, because exactly like, like the first, uh, the keynote speaker said, uh, unfortunately, science is, is getting now entangled with politics and the geopolitics are really affecting the way we can do our job. I can tell you from personal experience, I have lost all my contacts in China and I had a lot. And I have lost all my contacts in, in Russia, and I had a lot. In both countries, I have had appointments in, in, in very good universities, completely lost. So that clearly affected my work, um, and it will affect others. So let me pass to the, to the, to the, to the, to the final uh, panelist, the uh, one on the very left, uh, my left. Um, uh, Gia. Uh, Gia Rao, Dr. Gloria, yeah, yes. how do you pronounce this? Joya. Joya, Joya. Uh, 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 Dr. Joya Rao uh, is a, a very, very smart um, uh, person. She is an astrophysicist. Well, I cannot even imagine. Um, <laughs> she, is, uh, she is at uh, the Goddard uh, Space Flight Center right here outside of town uh, for NASA. She's originally from uh, Italy, right? Um, uh, and, and, and she has uh, degrees in astrophysics from the University of Vienna. I don't know what's happening here with Vienna. I mean, uh, I don't know what's, what's going it's on. It's a beautiful huh? city. Yeah. It's a, yeah. Actually, it has been again voted for the third time in a row as the most livable city internationally. And coming from Rome, I can confirm that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so, so she has uh, she has uh, two more degrees from La Sapienza in Rome, um, very good university as well. So uh, uh, she's doing extremely interesting research uh, at the cutting edge and getting a lot of fellowships. So uh, she will talk 
she will talk a little bit. She will give us her opening statement. Yes, thank you. Please, welcome. Um, so I actually am here as a delegate of the uh, ISNAF leadership. So I will remove my astrophysics hat and put my ISNAF hat. And um, I have um, worked closely with ISNAF president, Dr. Cinzia Zufada, and uh, ISNAF vice president, Dr. Enrica de Torre. And I am sharing you know, with you um, their uh, leadership observation. And so actually, I have a little bit of introduction about what ISNAF is, the Italian scientist and scholar in North America Foundation. And so I would like to, to uh, introduce this foundation to you with, with this um, presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Jackson. So, so uh, we're great. <laughs> So we are a no-profit organization, um, and the, we, are, we have a mission to connect, empower, and celebrate the Italian di intellectual diaspora in North America, and to maintain a shared sense of identity and common culture. So we have been established in 2007 uh, by 36 founding members, including four Nobel Prize winners, and we have at the moment over 3,300 uh, members. And so all our members are volunteer, including me, um, and we can reach over 3,000 scholars and researchers all over um, the US and Canada. Um, and we are researchers and technologists from Italy. So we are, the, the, the requisite is to be first generation Italian. And so we really can rely on the commitment and experience uh, of this member um, with the proven ability to develop institutional level programs. And we partner often, for example, with the Embassy Italy uh, Embassy of Italy in the US initiative uh, to support the diaspora. And so here I'm showing you a, a map of where we, where our members are located uh, across all over the US and Canada, and also the disciplines that uh, we touch. So from humanities and so social sciences to life sciences that occupies most, most of the, this chart, physical sciences and engineers. So here at the glance is, is our board of director, the president, Dr. Uh, Cinza uh, Tufada, vice president, Dr. Enrica De Torre, honorary board, scientific council, all our chapters, I will tell you more about it later, affiliation and, and activities that we do. So we really make the intellectual uh, uh, Italian diaspora in North America accessible, uh, recognized and, and uh, uh, nurtured. How do we do this? By facilitating uh, connections, so proactively seeking um, members all across the US and Canada, organizing events and networking opportunity, facilitating academic, scientific, and technological cooperation between Italy and North America. We celebrate also the achievements of this uh, scholar by providing um, awards to most young and also more um, established researchers. But also we support the new generations through mentorships programs, both uh, for um, high potential early career researchers in North America, but as well as Italian students interested in study and work opportunities in North America. And uh, those fellowships are usually funded uh, by our donors. And so in recent year, let me tell you a bit more about this mentorship program. In recent years, over 200 early career researchers and students have received this mentorship. There is a yearly application call. Uh, we can access a very large mentor pool. And the connections with the local chapters all across the US can provide additional mentorship opportunities. And so we have a lot of success stories, actually, from our former mentees. So um, they, we have helped them identify potential, for example, institution and advisor fit for the PhD. We have helped them write a successful application for assistant professor position or even identify prospective US host in the application of the Marie Curie um, fellowships. So of course you can find more about this on our website. We also have been a partner with many Italian organizations and institution um, administering fellowships, for example, with the Ministero dell'Ambiente, uh, Italian universities, the Italian Space Agency, and uh, Thales Anino Spazio, which is a company and other organization. And so all these programs and, and, and uh, 
processes are established via memorandum of understanding and implementation agreement. So uh, the review and selection committee has particip participation from internet members. And also we, uh, the members are eligible to host award recipients. And so we welcome uh, um, interested sponsors or donor who wants to start a program. And so um, why would you like to partner with us? So we facilitate the creation of bridges between Italy and North America to support research and development and innovation. We provide also value to foundation, consortium, and, and professional organization by provi providing, for example, strategic consulting, facilitating technology scouting, um, organizing outreach and networking events. And also we provide value to industrial partners by, for example, connecting them with a talented young researcher or uh, supporting the workforce development, education and recruiting in North America. And so we work with foundation who share the mission to empower the younger generation for a better future. And us, our, the volunteer, uh, of ISNAP develop and manage programs directed to talented young Italians that are paid uh, by our sponsors. And so because of our low administrative costs, the nation can have a truly big impact. For example, toward tuition offsets, research project, fellowships and internship or named award. So I will be happy to network, uh, you know, to tell you more about ISNAP later in our uh, networking session, but um, Dr. Novara, I want you to tell us now, yeah. after you have presented this, yeah. what do we learn from other, for other countries in, in a few sentences? So what why, do we, we, why are we interested in this if we are from other countries? Why you would like to be interested in it? But, yeah, I mean, why do we present this here? I, I, <laughs> I just say that <laughs> we can partner together. Mm. So um, we work a lot, for example, uh, with um, uh, you know, other uh, we, we would like to partner with other diasporas in the in the U.S. to okay. work together. Okay, and but there are many organizations like this. Why? What lessons do we get uh, for us, for the rest of us? Not who wants to partner, but what do we learn? If I am from uh, from uh, Kenya and I don't have such an organization, what do I learn from you? What you learn from Isna? Yeah. This is your question. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, I mean, we, we can share, uh, for example, perspective of how we uh, develop these fellowships between uh, Italy and the US, and between the US and Italy, so on both direction of the of the Atlantic. Uh, we can share perspective of how we um, provide mentorship or how we um, develop these awards for young and more established researchers. Um, but also, uh, if you uh, uh, may allow me, I wanted to reply to your question that you asked uh, earlier about the geopolitical environment. So mm -hmm. just share our, our perspective as is enough. So I wanted to say that those are certainly hard times of increasing uncertainty in the geopolitical environment um, and therefore challenging time for the mobility of people and so and, and the sharing of knowledge. And so us as ISNAF, uh, we have seen how um, there have been challenges time, for example, in, in getting um, new people uh, to the US because of the visa restrictions um, and also at the same time the pandemic. And uh, for example, um, we have analyzed our membership data and seen that 10% of the registered participants, uh, of the registered people left the US in the recent past, probably do also uh, to this. A good part returned to Europe, most of them not to Italy, which is their origin country, but to other European countries, just because more often the Italy um, offer opportunities for re-entry of talent. Um, and so, you know, 10% means 300 people of our more than 3,300 member. And so, but also is it worth noting that based on our data, our membership actually has increased in the, in the recent past few years in spite of the, of the perceived decrease of inflow, both <laughs> to the pandemic and the visa restriction. And, and this is partially due um, to, the way with that we have developed, for example, online seminars and um, online uh, mentee activities, uh, men mentee mentor activities, and also I believe that now we are very privileged. I mean, if this this would have happened twenty or thirty years ago, would have um, 
a completely another situation, but now we are privileged to live in an era of virtual instant communication potentially everywhere. And so we have taken opportunity to, to develop this, this webinar series and maintain a, a sense of shared, uh, you know, community um, and actually increase our mentorship program. And so, um, as I mentioned, we are an organization of volunteer and we frequently speak to other organizations and institutions. Uh, and thus, we are more effective and impactful at uh, leveraging our resources for uh, for the good of the people on both sides of the Atlantic. And so this is what we call uh, con connecting and the power in the Italian uh, diaspora. And also I want to, to briefly mention that, you know, with such hub of, of uh, talented people, we, we can uh, promote mobility and um, our own community unique perspective could help enrich, um, accelerate and expand the, the training opportunity of the next generation of researchers and technologies in Italy and, and also here. For example, we this year we have uh, partnered, um, uh, proudly partnered with the University of Pisa and the Polytechnic University of Torino, who host a number of their master and PhD students at an initial set of prestigious universities. And we often partner, uh, as I mentioned, you know, uh, with, with, with Italian embassy. And so to conclude, I would like to add that we stand ready to take a more integrated and systematic role, hopefully also with an increased support by the Italian government. Thank you. Um, what I, the big lesson I take from this is from what you said at the very beginning, um, which was that you are a volunteer. That's a lesson for me. So, so if there are people out there, scientists who expect their government to give them budget to do this, to do that, why they don't support me? Well, this is ridiculous. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, actually a role to play even without budgets and without big things, right? Um, if we believe in what we do. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so let's uh, let's go. The, uh, the the floor is open now with at least the first question, which is what's changing out there, and 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 what do you see for the future uh, for for this topic for uh, international? Kim, you want to address? Oh, um, sure. Um, I, I'm happy to address that. Um, it's certainly a, a very changing and, and difficult geopolitical times. I did want to say that I think in my opening remarks, I said that it was always true that science and science diplomacy was not above politics. I believe that's true. That doesn't mean it's, it's not being felt more or felt in a different way. Um, in the question on research mobility, I was also going to say that another thing that's changed is um, sort of topics of scientific collaboration. So it's not just the complexities leading to less or different changes of research mobilities, but it's also on the, the different topics of, of research collaborations. And so one that comes to mind is uh, emerging technologies, right? And this probably comes to mind because earlier in this year, we published a, a special issue on emerging technologies and science diplomacy where we put forward that emerging technologies do really pose several challenges to diplomacy because they deal with many scientific fields and have diverse applications. Some of them are unknown. They have a potential for serious national security threats, uh, risks that are constantly evolving, and they've been a, a subject of tension across nations. And so it's an example of a, of a time where people are, how do we strike that right balance to continue to have international scientific collaboration on important issues? and not go too extreme on one, on one side, right? So I believe there are real national security risks, but I don't believe that's enough to close off all scientific collaboration on that. So I think it's a really, um, I'm glad I don't have to make those decisions and people like Alice and other stage department can help with those on how do you strike that balance with not closing the door to important international scientific collaboration, but also not sort of putting each nation at risk for security risks. So I would say, the topics and mobility are, are something about. Thank you. Any other panelists? The floor is open. Who wants to address it? Yeah, I can jump in. Can I repeat the question just to remind the audience? Yes, I yes, so repeat the question. Okay, so this is Nick's question at the beginning, but correct me if I misstate this. Given the rapid changes in the geopolitical environment and the increasing complexity and uncertainty, what do you see as the complications in the movement mobility of people and knowledge? How do these dynamics affect talent mobility? So I think I agree with everything Kim said um, and with much of what the, the panelists have said so far. Nick, I think you focused on one really important phrase, which is brain drain and brain gain. 
And that to me is a very bi-directional focus on, on the movement of talent. And I do think the phrase brain circulation is probably more appropriate because it doesn't have that direct someone loses and someone wins connotation, which I think is really important when we're thinking about what we want our scientific community to be, to really tackle the kinds of issues that the world is facing. I do think fundamentally at the top, and then I can go into a little more detail on the question, the United States and Europe have the world's most significant and long-standing scientific and research partnerships, so I don't see that changing. And Florent mentioned this uh, during his remarks, that that we've had really significant and constructive dialogues recently, including the USEU Joint Consultative Group, which was a meeting in October where we focused on the kinds of research collaboration that need to occur between the two continents. And that includes a number of the topics that we've already mentioned. Another thing that has happened in the past few weeks is the Open Doors report has come out. So we did actually see there were 83,000 students during the 2021 to 2022 academic year of European students who came to the US. That was a 20% increase from the previous year. Of course, these numbers are still seeing um, lingering effects of COVID restrictions and other things, but we are seeing very strong mobility between the two continents and certainly it's something we can focus on more. I do think fundamentally, and these are remarks that um, the National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan noted earlier this fall, the US government really does believe the importance of developing, attracting and retaining talent is part of our technology agenda. And that cannot be understated. That's certainly from the US perspective, but I can imagine that many other countries feel exactly the same, that ability to develop, attract and retain talent because it's so critically important for all of the uses of technology for the global economy and then certainly for each domestic economy as well. But nurturing that STEM talent is critically important and this administration has taken a number of steps to do so. I have a list of some of them but in the interest of time I'm not going to go through them because they're, they're all publicly available. But certainly these, these kinds of, of changes coming from the Department of Homeland Security, the State Department related to OPT, related to H-1B, related to visa eligibility and interviewing, all of these things, all of these changes were really fundamental to try and make sure that we could enhance <laughs> that very important mobility between the student communities, not only from the United States, but then from European and other partner countries as well. So related to the, the China topic, just very briefly, and then I'll, I'll turn over to additional panelists. I do think we are in a, a very challenging situation and Secretary Blinken earlier this year kind of announced what the US-China strategy would be. And certainly Secretary Raimondo spoke about this yesterday at MIT as well. The idea of the United States with China is really to invest, align and compete. And if you look at those three different pillars, the first two are focused on investing, which means the US investing in itself and aligning, meaning the US working very closely with partners and allies. And I think it's critically important that we think two of the three pillars are focused on strengthening the domestic science and technology ecosystem and making sure that we are doing that with our partners and allies. I don't think that can be understated, even understanding the difficulties that exist broadly about the politicization, the politicization of science. Thank you. Um, I wish you could do something about the universities here because, uh, yeah, uh, because, uh, because uh, I can tell you that last year we have uh, several cases of uh, students, very good students that we have accepted from abroad and not only from China. Uh, but I, I talk about all of Africa and, and, and other places who could not, believe it or not, they applied for the fall, this fall semester in September, to sign September, and the American embassy gave them uh, interviews for uh, visas uh, next April. So, so we've had some complications with, with issues like that and travel of uh, scientists and so forth. So let's hope that... Uh, I think will be resolved quickly. There you are. Um, thank you both. And I just want to add the, um, the other perspective. I mean, not the US, 
Because when we are talking about the talent, we also need to think about the global south and the other people from other countries, mm -hmm. underdeveloped countries, right? So there are, uh, I can list so many, but just uh, say a few, for example, there is a big internationalization of higher education. So they also want to be in this game, right? All the universities, but from African countries or Latin American countries. So they try to really make their best to involve in this internationalization of higher education or research, but they don't have enough capacities or capabilities. So they need more support from developed countries. So it also affects the talent mobility. And uh, the other one is the growing scale and scope of international migration. It's changing, but it's growing. At the same time, uh, the dynamics has, uh, have been changing. And uh, you mentioned in the, this emerging technology, they really want to adapt themselves to how the developed countries have been doing, but they cannot. So they want to have more talent outside, but at the same time, they want to gain them, but they don't know how to do that. So because of this, perhaps scientific diasporas are important because they need to reach out them again to take these frames to their countries, right? So there might be some strategies on that. So there are a lot of domestic factors at home. What I see is that, for example, <clears throat> economic and political instability. And you know that there are a lot of you know, countries have these instabilities and the talent don't want to stay in their countries and looking for other options. Open doors, you know, even there, we just uh, finished a survey, uh, your access North America. And we were really surprised by the uh, results because we were expecting that the visas and our, all these things would be the most challenging part for these talent coming want to come to Europe. But the main uh, point was there. No, I mean when they you know when they decide they are ready to deal with these visas and everything. But the main thing is that how they can improve their career development, how they can just move out to their from their country and develop their you know research and other. So this is something that there are pull and push factors, you know, and by the way, I read the, the thesis of already that you mentioned. Mm. It's very, I think <laughs> it's important to see how also the other countries and developed countries try to make some connections through their, you know, uh, networks. And uh, they have the infrastructure for research, it's very cool, right? Uh, for example, my sister is a chemist professor she cannot go back to Turkey because she cannot find the lab in Turkey that she can go on uh, with her, you know, own uh, you know, works. It's it's now not yeah. possible, something like this. And the uh, outdated regulatory and legal frameworks. We all need to update ourselves according to these new developments. So these are the things all related to the countries, small or big. But in general, when we look at the future, what I see is that there are more challenges which affect the talent of mobility in general. The first one is geopolitical conflicts. Now, war in Ukraine, before that, in Afghanistan, Syria, you know, there are so many uh, researchers, scientists try to uh, still have been trying to go to Europe or come to US, right? So there is a, uh, there, I'm pretty sure that there is a list of researchers who are waiting on the list to enter the, the developed countries like Canada. And global crisis, this is the fact that we understood after the COVID-19 pandemic that we need to be prepared for these kind of crises. We need to collaborate. And after these, uh, this crisis, especially COVID-19, we just understood that scientists are important. Scientists are important, but scientists, because we need to trust them, and uh, especially, uh, you know, the importance of how these science advice mechanisms are important because, uh, okay, scientists are telling the truth or, you know, the results of their work, but at the same time, the politicians need to hear, right? So I think why the diaspora is now, I want to come to this point again, because it is not the voice of one researcher, it is the voices of a network. So these networks are, because of this, important, because when you have some findings or some realities in your hand, so that as in SNAP, I, I mean, on behalf of 3,000 researchers, 
you can, you know, uh, convey your message, right? So you're going to be more stronger. And we have here Echo, so they have more than 3,000 or how many thousand researchers. So they're all over the world, something like this, and gain from Germany from here again. So, and again, uncertainties. Uh, Florent also mentioned there's so many uncertainties about energy. You know, just because of the war in Ukraine, Europe saw that they should change the energy policies. So it is all but related about talent. Who is going to change this? Scientists, right? So the, the tell the, now the countries are trying to put more emphasis for the scientists and you know how to collaborate with the others, but at the same time how to uh, you know think about the national interest. So these are the other things that I want to mention. So all of these um, challenges really affect the mobility of researchers in general. So the last point is that what may how this affects the countries. They so the um, the global competition talent is getting a bit more harder and bigger, and more countries are trying to be uh, in this you know competition with their uh, more uh, programs or fundings. And probably we are going to discuss it later on tomorrow. So yeah. question number two. Yes, well, I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let me underline one thing that you that you said. Um, um, Europe, uh, people in Europe, uh, uh, I feel have a little bit of misunderstanding of how the American system works. So, 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 so people in various European countries, friends of mine, um, that that have some positions, they, they they come and tell me frustrated, right, in private conversations. But what is going on with your country over there? Our government is trying to talk to your president or to your uh, secretary or to whomever, and they, there is nothing off the head, and and nothing is happening. And I tell them, you guys, you just misrepresent, uh, misunderstand the American system. The American system does not work with the president and the, and, the, and the secretary. The American system works from the bottom up. So if you want to influence the American system, go to the newspapers, go to your friends, go to the, to the general public and influence those who put pressure to the, to the people above. Right, um, that is missed by by most Europeans who think that uh, things work out like in Europe. Um, so, if the government wants to do this and problem, then uh, people follow uh, the, the, what what the government if they agree of course, uh, with us. Not in the United States. So, this involvement, I say this because this involvement of science expatriates in 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 actually everyday business where they are. In the United States, it's critical of critical It's absolutely critical. If if there are thousands upon thousands of European researchers here and they just go to their labs and they go back home and they complain and they and they read the newspapers and they go back and forth and, and all they 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 experience, somebody will solve the problem, then they are mistaken. Then they don't understand the system in which they are. Literally. I, 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 I tell you, this is absolutely guaranteed. I've been in this country for 40 years and it's absolutely critical. Right? Just point. Now, uh, Evelina, do you want to address uh, something or, or we go to, to the next? Whatever, whatever. Go Actually, on. I would uh, disagree with you. <laughs> Very good. Do you want to uh, have a discussion here? Uh, actually, well, uh, first of all, what I really... Uh, one thing I, I, I agree with you is that um, what is what I really notice here is uh, these revolving doors we, we could uh, have more in Europe. Scientists going in and out of the administration. I think this is really enriching uh, here, and uh, they bring in their scientists view into the administration, take go back to the uh, to science uh, with the viewpoint of the administration and the work they have done here and there. So I think this is very uh, a model which we could really apply more in Europe. Uh, but then I disagree. I think uh, there is a lot of political uh, will here or uh, will to, 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 to shape science and science policy and research and innovation policy. The Congress has a very strong saying in that, at least this was my uh, perception so far, um, that, um, that 
that science policy is not all is is of course bottom up because we have many researchers here and they 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 uh, they know how the system works. But also the Congress and and the administration has a strong say on how to and why to do science and in which areas to do science. Uh, I don't want to say it's good or bad, or, uh, but it's just I think um, and I, I would like to simply to add that perception here. Yeah. But who is in Congress is the question. Yeah, I know, but then again. They don't look horizontally, they look vertically always. Who is who is electing them? They are sharply mm -hmm. um so if those who elect them to their uh, constituents, I know. Yeah. It, it moves up. Uh, Kim can tell us exactly how how they influence uh, Congress here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Professor, I may, uh, I may briefly interrupt, and uh, panelists, feel free to use me in your back pocket, and I'll come up if you uh, want me to save you from a tough question. <laughs> Professor Benardis, uh is uh, contributing to the spirit of discussion. We have um, from the European Commission live via Zoom, so perhaps we are in the metaverse, as Laurent remarked, because I was trying to coordinate the time zone difference and everything. So if it's okay, I'll briefly pause the panel. He'll give maybe five minutes of remarks uh, live from the commission. It's live. It's live. He will be live in a moment whenever we're ready. And then we can take okay. what we left out and, and leave the timing to, to the six. Sure, sure. Excellent. One moment. Thank you all. Is it ready? You will be as soon as I uh, get this. Question. I'm here. Can you hear me? You are ready. I can hear you. You won't be okay. able to um, unfortunately, I cannot. I cannot uh, start my camera because the host has stopped it. So, probably you need to enable me to to launch my camera. <clears throat> but but otherwise, I can also just speak because I wanted to show you a few few slides. Um, well, hello everybody in uh, in uh, Washington D.C. And um, obviously, I don't want to spoil your interesting discussion <laughs> that you are having. Um, really fascinating topic to, to talk about. Um, I, I'm going to share uh, just a few slides, um, if you allow me. Um, just just one second. And you should be able to turn your camera if you wish. However, your screen uh, is so It's okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, you should, should be able to see the slides now. Very good. Okay, well, I just wanted to um, throw into the discussion some reflections about uh, European science diplomacy. <clears throat> My name is Jan Marco Müller, and I coordinate uh, science diplomacy in multilateral relations at DG Research and Innovation in the European Commission. And um, obviously, uh, as uh, we have also been discussing at this event, I mean, science diplomacy, of course, uh, has grown a lot in importance and in visibility in the past 10, 15 years or so. And we saw lots of initiatives um, mushrooming in different parts of the world. Um, we saw initiatives, for instance, at local level. We see initiatives like looking into anticipation um, and foresight. Um, of course, all sorts of summer schools, of uh, journals, declarations, really a lot uh, of buzz going on there. And now uh, it's quite interestingly in, a, in past years, more and more member states have actually adopted um, science or tech diplomacy related strategies. Yeah? So we've seen this for instance in, in countries like, like Germany, like France, like Spain, uh, Denmark and, and many others. Um, also quite an interesting development is uh, we have more and more science diplomacy people in ministries of foreign affairs. So, so people like, like Alison, um, in the State Department, we also have um, such uh, functions, but they are quite different in terms of, you know, their setup and their mandates and their titles. So um, there's, for instance, Dirk Jan Koch, who is the Chief Science Officer um, at the Dutch Foreign Ministry, but we also have a Special Envoy for Science Diplomacy in the Czech Republic, an Ambassador at Large for Science in the Slovak Republic, a Head of Science Diplomacy in Hungary. And you see on the, on the image to the right there, that was the first physical meetings of these people when they met uh, earlier this year at, at ITER, at a fusion reactor in, in southern France, which in itself, of course, is a very interesting science diplomacy project. And a lot has been happening at the EU level as well. So we had, um, uh, you probably aware of the, the Three Horizon project in Horizon 2020, three dedicated projects that advanced our knowledge about uh, science diplomacy and the methodologies, developed training materials, and they gave birth to what is called the European Union Science Diplomacy Alliance, which is the platform kind of bringing together the, the community. 
Um, but at the same time, of course, we need to acknowledge that also science diplomacy has been changing in past years. So um, if you look on the left side, the report, Open Innovation, Open Science, Open to the World, it was still what I, what I call the honeymoon phase of science diplomacy. You know, be, be nice to each other, um, build bridges, keep doors open, etc. And this, of course, is much more nuanced uh, in, in past years when we talk more and more about issues like foreign interference, like disinformation, and of course, we are now being faced this year also with the issue of scientific sanctions. So, so apparently science diplomacy is not just um, carrots, it's also sticks. And, and one may discuss also coming back to the original definition from the Triple S Royal Society, um, whether one might also want to talk about uh, diplomacy in, in science, which we have seen um, in terms of, you know, the scientific community taking diplomatic action, um, for instance, by saying, I'm not going to work anymore with that Russian university, for instance. So if I would uh, uh, describe the state of European science diplomacy, it is still largely uncoordinated science diplomacy efforts and still not yet a lack of, there's a lack of EU approach. And this of course, in times of a rapidly changing geopolitical, but also scientific technological environment. And, and what we really would like to see, and that's a quote from the global approach to research innovation, which is the international science strategy of the EU, is to develop human leadership in science diplomacy to project soft power and pursue our economic interests and values more effectively. And uh, last year in September, there were council conclusions on this uh, international strategy, the global approach to research and innovation, where the commission um, was uh, requested by uh, the member states to develop a European science diplomacy agenda and where member states highlighted the importance of integrating the global approach into the union's external action. And uh, when you um, hear the words European science diplomacy agenda, then of course the first question is, okay, what do you mean by European? What do you mean by science diplomacy? And what do you mean by agenda? And the question, what do you mean by European is actually not so straightforward. It's not so trivial because Europe in research, thinking of the European research area is something different than Europe in terms of the common foreign security policy, which is actually just 27. And uh, also we have the issue of European institutions versus member states. Of course, uh, research is, is kind of a joint policy, but both member states and commission does. Um, but also uh, uh, the, the, the foreign policy is a sovereign policy of member states. And where the issue which has been kind of more and more been taken, especially since the pandemic also is this team Europe approach. So both European institutions and member states together. And of course we need to link to this and also to our like-minded partners elsewhere. Uh, what I mean by science diplomacy is actually also not so straightforward because you all see these, these terms flying around like science diplomacy, tech diplomacy, innovation diplomacy, STI diplomacy. Sometimes they may seem to mean the same. Sometimes they mean different things. Science diplomacy often being used as the umbrella term. And at the same time, you have the mushrooming of these thematic diplomacies like climate, water, energy, digital space, etc. And they are all underpinned by science as well. Um, so, so the approach we are taking is science diplomacy really to take it in an integrated way, natural sciences, social science, engineering, medicine, education, and, and to focus with this agenda really on the how question, um, actually how to bring the worlds of science and diplomacy together, not to what, because otherwise we would interfere with a lot of policy processes. And what do you mean by agenda? It's, it's really about uh, something that would be non-binding based on voluntary commitments, but forward looking with uh, concrete actions. And this is something that should be co-created with participants from both spheres, science and diplomacy. And then of course, kind of a reality checked by, by the stakeholders. And that's where we are at the moment, kind of defining what we want to do. And we've identified three main strands and that's my, my last slide already. Um, it's first to strengthen the interactions between research policy and foreign policy. So in terms of the structural linkages, linking the programs, but also in terms of um, you know, uh, the global science diplomacy outreach, the role of science diplomacy in embassies and, the, and delegations. The second large uh, item is making diplomacy resilient through foresight evidence and strategic use of scientific cooperation, which when we're talking about science advisory ecosystems, about tackling global challenges, the role of science diplomacy in multilateralism, the global commons, uh, but also public diplomacy. So these disinformation, et cetera, aspects and how to tackle them. And of course, the, the issue of science diplomacy in times of war and when relations are difficult. And the last big item is building capacity for European science diplomacy, which requires capacity building 
on the side of the diplomats, but also on the side of the scientists. And of course, thinking about the careers at the interface, because we need also the experts at the interface that are able to translate between the two sides. So these were just my talks and my, my, my points I wanted to make here. And I think the big opportunity we really have now is to think how actually does a modern science diplomacy look like that fits into this uh, strange world we live in with all these um, fragmentations we see with the polarization, but also, um, you know, these issues around the, the power games related to, to technologies, uh, um, the whole issue around, you know, uh, facts uh, and, and uh, alternative truths as they, as they call it now. now. Um, so really what does science diplomacy mean? It is really also about taking you know, a new approach and a new fresh look at what science diplomacy can actually deliver in such a context. And that's what I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so um, just a second, I need to stop sharing and then uh, over to you. Thank you very much. So Jan is not staying with us, right? He's not. No. Um, so, so, unless you want me to, <laughs> sure. Why not stay with us? Um, um, you are very welcome. Uh, now, uh, your talk reminded me of uh, something very important to 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 give you an, an another example of how this uh, this situation today uh, engages into science. Now, um, uh, Delia there is, uh, is uh, I forgot to say at the beginning, Daria is uh, editing uh, a special issue in science and public policy, uh, which is a, an academic journal in, in, in our field um, on science diplomacy, but in, in, in the global south. I have never told her what my biggest fear was when she chose the topic. Do you know what it was, my biggest fear? that the Russian author will, will submit a paper. Um, because in that same journal, we had to deal actually with the issue where a referee, uh, after the invasion, uh, a referee asked us, uh, is, are the authors of this, uh, of this paper Russians? Is any of the authors of this paper Russian? And if it is, take me off the list and, and the journal, should not publish these uh, these uh, these kinds of uh, papers. This was a very very um, uh, difficult issue to to to, to do <coughs> because the journal, the academic journal, is open to science. I mean, we are not discussing politics there. We are discussing uh, uh, science policy. You know, um, and and I know my colleagues in in Russia. Uh, I have been working with the higher school of economics, they are totally international. They are completely into the issues. They, 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 they are interested in, 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 in that stuff. And, and that was my biggest fear. But until now, have you dealt with, with anything like this? No. Uh, not yet. Not, not yet. Good. I think I also want to add something. Uh, as a part of this seminar series of George Washington, we are going to have another uh, online event on this you So you're welcome to join us with Pierre Bruno and Singapore friends and I, because we're the two co-editors. Yes. We are going to discuss all the papers together. So with the writers, with the authors. So I think you're also might be interested in the what I'm doing that. And the, the important thing there is that these are the views of the other countries. You understand? I mean, always we hear about the United States, we hear about Germany, we hear about Germany, but now we want we want the views of the other countries. From China, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Evelina, I, 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 we stopped you in the middle. Continue. So, so I think I think um, I don't know if Jackson, Jackson, do we have any question online? If we do, we can we can actually address it. If we not, yeah, I, I want to make sure because I saw two chats there. Yeah, in the... okay. If he's willing to share the question written, and we can read it. Uh, in the meantime, please do. Okay. So we have Lauren. Uh, we have. Uh, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just a very pragmatic question. Uh, talking about mobility, brain gain. So it's a, a test question. 
There has been 45,000 digital talent that lost their job in the Silicon Valley in the last month. Mm. So I have a question to the European because I see there are science council from Italy, Austria, and, and Germany. If there is any plan to attract them to Europe because right. it's a national competence, the visa, and what the Department of State thinks about uh, this type of mobility. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. This is a great question. Go ahead. I'll I'll start. Uh, actually, yeah. there is um, there is well on the on the on the official level no. <laughs> Let's say uh, I mean we uh, we have different programs to to attract researchers, but we have not spe uh, specifically approached them because this is quite a tricky and political issue. As you can, uh, I mean, you know why we pose the question. So, but uh, I'm I'm sure that many research organizations are very interested in uh, in reaching out to them. That's uh, that I can I can assume. Yeah. Maybe I can add that perhaps on a, those are mostly U.S. talents. Um, that are software engineers mostly and and used to work in a US environment. Um, and it will be really beneficial to Europe to attract them and, and let them work there. Just they are used to, to this environment and and also to you know to very different lifestyles. So they they will will need to work on that and, and to, to what Europe can offer them to attract them. Yeah, could be a resource. I think the question is absolutely correct uh, because I don't, I don't, I don't think that they are primarily U.S. Actually, because if I see the statistics, the statistics tell me that at least half of the researchers uh, in Silicon Valley are foreign born. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I'm not very sure. I'm not very sure that they are there. Okay, let's go to the next. The lady here, but the, the microphone to here in front, in front, Christine. Hi, my name is Contessa Burbo. I'd like to thank the panelists for this event. I'd like to ask Mr. Chan Marco Miller and Evelina Santa and Allison from U.S. Department of State. They mentioned about uh, entanglement of um, on geopolitics, particularly Russia. If this process succeeds between Russia and Ukraine, should researchers from Russia go back to Europe and uh, vice versa, especially in Germany? You mentioned that they were removed after war was declared or invasion. What must be done or what do you see is going to happen if this process succeeds? Should they go back to your country or in Europe? Very good. Great question. Go. Uh, go. I was... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you very much for this very good question. Actually, uh, what I meant is that uh, we froze all relations on the governmental level with uh, Russian uh, Russian agencies and the Russian government in, in the science area. So we did not expel any uh, Russian researcher from Germany. Uh, on the contrary, we provided support uh, for who, whoever needed that support or if it was necessary to prolong the visa or whatsoever to stay in Germany and conduct research because we have many uh, Russian researchers, for example, at uh, days in Hamburg when it comes to accelerator research. So uh, we did the contrary. Uh, how it's going to develop after hopefully a very soon end of the war? Uh, well, this is... Uh, we, we will have to see, to be honest. I mean, we need cooperation on global challenges, obviously. And there is, uh, I mean, on the, on the personal level, people still sustain their contacts, and this is very necessary, I think. But we we will have to uh, to to see how we will uh, how we will deal afterwards. So the, there are some uh, thoughts ongoing, but I couldn't share them now with you yet. Uh, but it's, of course, a question, how do we do it after the war? What do we do? How, how can we integrate again, back again after the war? Uh, Jan, did you hear the question? Yes. Yes, I can answer as well. Of course, it needs a differentiated answer as far as Russia is concerned. <clears throat> Well, of course, uh, we also, I mean, have stopped the formal cooperations with Russia and, and Russian institutions and, and uh, they are no, not participating any longer in the in the Horizon program, for instance, both the ongoing projects, project proposals, etc. Um, 
but at the same time, we have kept the, the people-to-people -people interactions alive. So they still can, can participate in mobility schemes because there's, of course, also the other Russia, the one of the 8,000 scientists that spoke up against uh, uh, Putin. So that's something that we also need to consider. As, as far as Ukraine is concerned, um, obviously we have uh, put a lot of um, help schemes um, for uh, Russian uh, researchers uh, at risk and researchers in exile. So both them in Ukraine that have stayed in Ukraine, but also um, for them who, who uh, moved to other European countries, we've put those schemes into motion, um, helping them, for instance, easing access to, to the um, funding schemes, et cetera, et cetera, and, and helping them, of course, by platforms also simply to exchange the information what the different European countries can offer to, to Ukrainian researchers. Um, as far as the future is concerned, um, well, once uh, the war will end, and I hope for, uh, we of course hope that this will be uh, as soon as possible, um, there will be reconstruction of Ukraine. And afterwards, Ukraine is going to have the most modern research laboratories in the world. And I can tell you that I will want to go there because, quite simply because um, the, 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 they will have new facilities after the war. As of course, we all know this will require a lot of effort in terms of reconstruction and rebuilding. But I, I firmly believe that, that uh, in a longer term future, Ukraine has a bright future also in research. Thank you. Okay, very good. Anybody else who wants to? I can chime in briefly, I, but I agree with everything Jan Marco and Evelina said in that from the US government perspective, certainly we froze a lot of our government to government exchange with Russia, except where there are very clear national security interests in maintaining those, those official channels of cooperation. Um, but otherwise, we've we've really left that that researcher to researcher exchange at kind of the discretion of universities and of researchers, which I think is critically important for how we think about maintaining those scientific channels uh, moving forward. Certainly, in the past, for the United States, we have taken very direct action to attract talented scientists and researchers from Europe, both before and during World War II, and then certainly from from Russia a few decades later. So I think those are actions, and, and I would agree with what Jan Marco and Evelina said. I think there is a, a very strong idea, and this kind of gets to Florence's question as well, to make sure that we are maintaining an open and inviting uh, atmosphere for scientists and researchers to be able to stay and work here. Um, but I do think it's really important when we think about the war and afterwards that we're talking not only about the, the support that's necessary to Ukraine, um, but making sure that we're really thinking through the US, Russia, and Russia, and other bilateral partners as well. And so I think there are different sides of the coin that all have to be addressed. Certainly also for Ukraine, I know that the National Academies of the United States and the Polish Academy of Sciences have been working very closely together and have received a number of grants from different organizations to make sure that they're able to provide financial support for Ukrainian researchers and scientists around the world. So there are a number of, that's one effort, but there are a number of efforts that uh, my partners here on this panel, their countries and other countries are focusing on to make sure that we're thinking through that long-term sustainable support that Ukraine will need to rebuild. Thank you. Another question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Sorry, but I need to leave now. Okay, so. I yeah, didn't know for the debate. Thank you. Bye, Jan. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you everybody for your presentations and comments from Lake. Thank you so much. I want to address my question to Alison and Kim. And by the way, I'm from Turkish Embassy. I'm education counselor there, but have been an executive board member of Council of Higher Education of Turkey for the last seven years. So it's a long time in science and technology and education. So uh, about talking about the contacts. So whenever we are talking about the brain drain, brain gain, and the, we are talking about the talent and person, but we are not talking about the contacts as much as we have to do, because whenever somebody goes to somewhere, if we are uh, accepting somebody from Europe, from Africa, from Asia, and especially the US labs and research centers, wait for them to fit in. So they're not thinking about their context, their culture, their laboratory culture, et cetera. I think we have to focus on more. If they have great, the source country has great context, great culture. So why I'm asking this is because I faced with this when we are running a project calling academic heritage, preservation of the academic heritage in the Middle East because of the female refugees. I was shocked to have 
so many talented academics and their research labs hearing about them back in Syria because I didn't know about them. But when they come to our laboratories, our research centers, we have you know investing millions of dollars anymore about research, but their contexts were different and some of them were really good. So talking about them, do we have any plan for this brain gain or so about the context of them, bringing their culture and asking them how things going on in Italy, in Ukraine, in Germany, in Turkey, let's say. Right. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure how to answer your question. I think that's why I'm hesitating. It's a, it's a good question. Um, and I think it's a really important question because we've been talking a lot about how uh, science and science diplomacy operates in a context. You mentioned that you operate in a context and when you would get these offers from Europe, it's not going to be exactly the same. And I think your question is almost the flip side of that is like when somebody comes over here, how are we actually appreciating and utilizing their context, right? And I think it's a, a really important question. I'm just not sure I have the answer to it. Um, but I know that people are thinking about this. Like fresh on my mind is, is, is next week, we're gonna be at the World Science Forum in, in Cape Town. Um, and the theme of this World Science Forum is, is science uh, for, for social justice. But they have a number of, of you know, plenaries and thematic sessions that are actually trying to think about how are we thinking about someone as a whole person that they come into the science uh, arena? And then how are we making sure that we're doing better partnerships between sort of previously research strong and research uh, weak countries? And how do we do that in a better way uh, so that we really are doing it in the proper way? So I don't, I think your question is incredibly valid. I'm not sure I have the answer, but it is something I think that I've been in privy to people thinking about that more than before, I will say. I don't know about you, Alan. Yeah, no, I, I agree with what Kim said. And I think part of it comes down to how do you create that welcoming environment to make sure there's that diversity that that feels and has the opportunity to speak to provide that insight that they have from their own background, experience, cultural um, background, et cetera. That I think more broadly, so not even science background, but that I think is something that has changed dramatically with the way humans interact with social media and digital media in general. And that it's very easy to be with uh, similar minded people and lose that ability to connect with people who are different than you. And that's something I think there are a number of efforts, not even necessarily by the State Department, although certainly we're always in, involved in these kinds of efforts diplomatically, but there are a number of different groups thinking about how do you ensure that uh, the way we're fostering young scientists, young researchers, young humans in general, that we're, we're building in that idea of a global citizen because that is critically important, regardless of whether you're talking about science or not. I think there's still much work to do in that space, yeah. but I, I think it's really important that people are focused on it, just like you said. I, yeah, I was just saying to, to the beginning of that, I completely agree on that, especially in Europe. Um, as a culture, certainly there is a lot of mobility if holding a European passport is very easy to work within Europe. Um, and, and a lot has been done in this respect, for example, with Erasmus uh, programs and so on. But the across, you know, across the Atlantic, there is a lot to build there, especially for the enrichment that the scientists that, that can gain as a professional scientist, but also as people and, and what they can eventually bring back or, or bring here. Area, your survey addressed this a little bit with the uh, challenges, right? Yes, uh, we asked about um, more than 200 researchers, and we had two uh, through this survey, and also we had three focus groups, and uh, we met with the diaspora leaders, and we are going to <clears throat> write a report on that to the European Commission, a kind of policy uh, feedback. But the main thing was not only the benefits of this talent to home countries, but also the other point is how about the host countries? Because this is something that if the US knows the main challenges or you know what the patterns of these talents, I think the US policies might be in the long term might be better because they know that uh, they appreciate these foreign talent, but what I see is that they're not working with them. I mean, with these diasporas. 
for this, uh, we will recommend some, of course, things, but the first one is to try to connect with them and mapping the diasporas. I mean, there are thousands of people in gay and ECUSA is now, but do the uh, US uh, government really do something for this to connect and to learn from them? I mean, why they wanna go back to other countries? What are the main challenges? So the survey also addresses this, but your question is really very timely because the US is not anymore the magnet for the high skill talents. And what are the reasons for that? I mean, yeah, I know that recently there are more works on that, <laughs> but before that, I think it was not very successful. So I think uh, this part is, I mean, what are the contributions of these talent for the host countries? It's another aspect of this talent competition. I mean, you want to, uh, of course, take this, uh, I mean, attract these talent, but how about how you can retain, I mean, make them stay in your country? Because there is, I mean, we mentioned, there is a big competition talent. And when you look at the advertisements of, for example, Size Magazine, you can see, more uh, opportunities for, I mean, from China, from India, from Latin American countries, from Japan. I mean, it's really interesting to see and you need to complete this, right? But this is not, I think the thing here, the most important, how we are going to collaborate, uh, balance the collaboration and competition. So this is a kind of really uh, important uh, thing that we need to also discuss. Very good, excellent. I had a question behind you, and then, and then, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, Johannes Egner, Austrian Embassy Scientific Counselor. Uh, to start with, uh, I think this is an excellent panel uh, singing praises to the Austrian capital, Vienna. Uh, I'm two of you are alumni of the University of Vienna, uh, three of you at least uh, live there. So great to hear that you love the place, but not only for its beauty, but also for, for the science and technology that's, that's done there. So I couldn't help just uh, then, then, then uh, saying that. Uh, to our topic now, um, I think we are all part of a bubble, and within this bubble, we are all uh, convinced that 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 we are for science, that we want to have open societies, and that we have have to have an exchange of the best ideas. But I think we have to understand that that we have to to fight for this kind of 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 the passion we have. And uh, when we do that, I think we should not, uh, we should try hard to get out of our respective bubbles and how to interact with the people on the street, uh, not uh, within the diplomatic circles and within the scientific circles, no, but, but within, within the people really on the ground uh, in the end with the taxpayers who just fund what we, what we are doing. So I think we really, this is just a statement, so not, not a, a question to the panel. We, I think we have to try hard and to 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 push hard to 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 have this discussion and to interact with the general public in each and every way we can. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank the panelists also uh, for this uh, nice organization organizers also. Uh, my name is I'm a professor of medicine and chemistry uh, in Istanbul Medical University. Recently moved to uh, United States back again, working for FDA. Um, speaking of surveys, uh, I wanted to bring actually some uh, to your attention, especially listen and uh, when since you work for the, at least uh, close to the policymakers and the decision makers. Uh, before the pandemic, there was a survey. Uh, global survey, uh, who do we trust, trust most? Which professions? Of course, the scientists. This survey was, I'm talking about 100,000, more than 100,000. I have the PDF, I can uh, pass it to you. Uh, of course, this is after the pandemic, and that increased. We trust now most scientists, doctors. And needless to say, uh, in all of those surveys in all our country, we trust the least uh, is the politicians, decision makers, lawmakers. And since we're talking about the scientific policy and the engagement and in, uh, this in the decision makers and lawmakers, how can we increase 
or maybe actually uh, uh, bring that gap to closer. Uh, we trust scientists and uh, uh, all around the world, global, especially since uh, Nick, Nick will talk about uh, actually uh, about the vaccinations and all these things. And uh, how can we increase the decision makers or lawmakers uh, to implement in the scientific policy, especially uh, post pandemic era? We need to uh, make sure that more the uh, decision makers and the scientists, how can uh, this can be implemented in terms of uh, governmental level? Uh, that's what my, especially the Alison and the Evelina, uh, that gap, how can we close that? Thank you. Thank you, Bram. Yeah. Uh, I'll start with you, uh, for me. Um, well, uh, this is the one million dollar question, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, if we ask climate researchers, they have been pushing and they have been uh, providing the data and the information, and still we have a COP27 coming out with uh, quite um, disappointing results, and uh, and policymakers still don't see the urgency. So um, I don't have a clear answer to that. I think it's it's communication, communication, and communication, and then it's uh, on many levels, and um, by also having in the policy sphere of sign, uh, people with a scientific background helps, I think, but also when we look into the future, I think we really need to invest in, in a good science education in our kids and, and reach as many kids as possible with, uh, with uh, understanding what science provides um, to, to raise you know, future policymakers, uh, future scientists uh, who have that uh, broader view on that. Um, but for the time being, I think it's really, uh, we all have to push hard for communication. That's what also Johannes was saying, getting out of our bubbles and talking to the people. Otherwise, um, yeah, uh, I think this is at least a, a, some intent or uh, some um, effort to do that, yeah. May I just add also one point? I think um, recently science diplomats or attaches or, you know, counselors also kind of a bridge between these researchers and politicians because they their main mission is to connect with these different stakeholders but related to science technology and innovation so this is very valuable and i think each country should have these uh, diplomats science diplomats because they gather all of the information from that country and then convey it to their policymakers so that it might be more relevant easier but I, I'm also saying that they need to be, uh, they need to work closer with these scientists and science advice mechanisms. They really do, uh, should not, uh, you know, uh, exclude this, the importance of this. So these two might affect this gap, I think, to address this gap. Can I take? Absolutely. Sorry. And uh, apologies for having this step out. Um, I think I, thanks to, to Ali, I understand your question and then Joanna's question. And because I'm working at AAAS, I, I can't let this go without saying that our CEO often says that instead of just dealing with science in the public, that our goal is how can we actually build bridges, as um, as been mentioned, between the scientific community and what we call sort of influencers in the public, right, versus just saying the public at large. And so we have quite a few programs. I, I talked about how, you know, one of my goals is to better build stronger connections between the diplomatic community. But at AAAS, we have a lot of programs that are actually dealing with connecting the scientific and the faith communities uh, across the US. And that program has also gone into the UK and other, other parts, um, doing better connecting the scientific and the press. And so we actually have scientists that work uh, in you know journalist uh, studios and not just in like the Washington Post and the New York Times, but actually in like the St. Louis Bush Dispatch. And other programs like that. And then, of course, uh, what's been alluded to is that AAAS has the Science Technology Policy Fellowship, uh, which will be 50 years next year, that we are both um, alumni in, where they actually put scientists in the executive branch and the congressional branch and now the judicial branch of trying to provide that scientific advice. I am being reminded that I have not been looking at my, at my watch very much. I told you at the beginning, I'm interested in this. <laughs> okay, I think I think uh, some people on the panel, perhaps some of the panelists have other things to do, but 
Um, I think we will close the panel at this moment. Uh, we will stay, as Jackson will explain the, the remaining logistics here, we will stay around, and I hope you do too, and, and we have a more meaningful discussion one-to-one. -one. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks the panelists, and, and um, they gave us the